best I can. The premise I'm starting with is that capitalism is the single most successful, prosperous, egalitarian, and robust economic system in human history. We need to examine not only how this can be so, but why it is so. And coming to this understanding is going to require us not only to examine the positives and negatives of capitalism, but also the positives and negatives of a few of its main historical competitors, namely socialism, communism, feudalism, fascism, and anarchism. Now that's a lot to unpack, so please bear with me a bit. Let's start with a few basic definitions to set things up. I'll pull these first two from Wikipedia, yes, I know, but for our purposes they will do. A social system can be reasonably defined as a patterned network of relationships constituting a coherent whole that exists between individuals, groups, and institutions. An individual may belong to multiple social systems at once. Examples of social systems include nuclear family units, communities, cities, nations, college campuses, corporations, and industries. The organization and definition of groups within a social system depend on various shared characteristics such as location, socioeconomic status, race, religion, societal function, or other distinguishable features. An economic system can be reasonably defined as a system of production, resource allocation, and distribution of goods and services within a society or a given geographic area. It includes the combination of the various institutions, agencies, entities, decision-making processes, and patterns of consumption that comprise the economic structure of a given community. As such, an economic system is a type of social system. From these definitions, we can glean that a social system is an area of human interpersonal behavior that governs a specific part of society. An economic system is a type of social system that governs finance and production, just like a legal system is a type of social system that governs law and order, and the same goes for political systems, cultural systems, and so on. This stuff becomes pretty obvious when you think about it. We can also define our end goal for any given social system being in the service of humanity, meaning a functioning social system must serve the needs of as many people as possible, with a social system being considered more functional than its competitors if it is capable of serving more people, serving the same number of people more efficiently, or serving the same number of people with the same efficiency, but at a higher quality. So quality, quantity, and efficiency. Now, I don't mean this in the strictest of utilitarian terms. In my video titled, When is Political Violence Acceptable?, I do spend some time picking apart utilitarian ethics. But let me give you the cliff notes here. The idea of the greatest good for the greatest number of people sounds moral at a glance, but there is no safeguard in place for the people that fall outside the bounds of the greatest number. This is what is commonly referred to as the tyranny of the majority. If you want a simplistic example of the failure of utilitarian ethics, there's always a bike cuck. In any case, this is not what I mean when I say that a social system needs to be in the service of humanity. While it's true that no social system can adequately protect the rights of and provide prosperity for every single human being, it also cannot actively work to violate the rights of or inhibit the prosperity of people not within the system, at least not without sufficient provocation. Now, there are some people who don't actually agree with me on this starting point. A good example of those people would be the hardline multiculturalists. When the claim is made that all cultures are basically the same, that they all have the same value, and that a nation is not intrinsically tied to its national cultures, but instead to all cultures of the world, on an equal basis, regardless of population demographics, or language, or history, or anything else that exists in reality, this is a rejection of the idea that a social system must prioritize people within the system. And there's not really an easy way to bridge the gap between these two points of view. I mean, what's the point of having a social system if the bloody thing doesn't perform its work primarily for the benefits of those invested in it? The multicultural point of view is that any social system must equally accommodate all people, regardless of their participation in the system. And this idea is both impractical and untenable. I mean, you can't continuously withdraw from society more than you deposit, any more than you can do so from a bank. But then again, I don't think that these people have ever had to balance a budget. So maybe I'm not so surprised that they think that piling on unrelenting burden is how social systems should work. But, if we do accept the idea that a good social system must prioritize an in-group while still not causing harm towards an out-group, that gives us a way to measure the relative effectiveness of the six economic systems I listed off earlier. Let's knock off some of the simple ones right away. On anarchism. Anarchism as an economic system, or really as any form of social system, is a complete joke. It doesn't work. It never will. I honestly don't think that the anarchists have any idea about the nature of humanity. I can simply say, go read On the Social Contract, and despite the flaws in that book, this is basically all the refutation anybody needs to throw all flavors of anarchism out the window. Anarchism describes a stateless society where there is no government, no power structure, and no nation. 
And if this society ever manages to come to fruition, it will be promptly flattened by the next society over that decides to actually unify into any type of fighting force, because a stateless anarchist society will be entirely defenseless. But that doesn't even matter because when you even get just two human beings together, there needs to be some form of self-mediation between them. Some basis by which they recognize each other on some level. Even the most primitive, ass-backwards, uncontacted tribes have a power structure, a chief of some kind directing the others, because as it turns out, organization and specialization are good things for society, and an anarchist society by its very definition lacks those virtues. If you want to see anarchy in action, go watch the Thinkery's video on Slab City. And if you want to get angry about it, realize that these people take food stamps from the US government so they can live in houses made of scrap metal in the middle of the desert and spend their time destroying other people's shit. Anyway, it's time for judgment. Remember our criteria. We can judge a social system if it provides for its in-group while protecting the rights of its out-group in its given field, which is, in this case, finance and production. Does anarchism do this? The answer is a resounding no. Not only does it fail to do this, it fails to exist in any meaningful way. And should an anarchist society ever actually exist, it will likely be the result of a massive nuclear holocaust where entire continents are on fire and the few dozen remaining members of humanity are spending their final moments eating each other because the Earth can no longer support life. On on socialism. Ah yes, socialism. Communism's little brother, and often considered a stepping stone for society moving from capitalism to communism. Social is defined primarily by social ownership of the means of production. There are many different stripes of socialism, but they are united by the idea of social ownership. The means of production, for those of you who don't know, is socialist and communist lingo for the factories, the farms, and the other locations, equipment, and methods used to produce goods or services. So, in a capitalist society, the owner of a factory would employ workers to run his factory and produce the goods of the factory in exchange for a negotiated wage, which the owner would then turn around and sell in the market. The revenue generated from the sale of the goods would then be used to provide for the wages of the workers, as well as pay the owner of the factory enough for him to live on in exchange for not only the owner's ownership of the factory, but for his work in directing and overseeing the production, the hiring and firing of workers, and the negotiation of sale in the marketplace for his products. Socialists believe that this setup is inherently unethical, that the means of production cannot be privately owned by one person, but must be socially owned. Well, what does social ownership entail? Let's ask an actual socialist. Yeah, I got into a shitty Twitter argument with this person a few months back. I kept it up solely because I knew I was going to be using her stupidity in a video eventually. I won't bore you with the details. You can go read it yourself if you've really gotten bored with hitting your own dick with a hammer and want something a bit more painful. Here's the gist of her argument. Bosses at work don't actually do anything of value. Workers do all the work. And management just gets fat off of it. Therefore, any workplace must be socially owned and must lack hierarchy. The workers would all hold an equal ownership of the workplace, and a council of workers would be elected to take the place of management. The council would collectively decide every decision the workplace makes, with input from the electorate of workers. Oh, also, in this hypothetical dreamlike scenario, the state would not exist. Yes, she was an anarcho-socialist. And that small townships and cities would have elected councils to independently rule them from any federal body. Which would effectively make them city-states and would not be anarchy, but fine, whatever. I don't know where to start here, this is so absolutely moronic. I asked her if she believed it was inherently unethical for a boss to offer money in exchange for a worker's work. She said yes, because even if both the boss and the worker consent to the arrangement, it's oppressive and exploitative because it involves a power structure. I asked her if it was possible for a worker to sell their partial ownership of a workplace, and she said no, because money would not exist. I asked her if having an elected council of workers would be too bureaucratic to function during a crisis situation, where a single boss having to make a quick decision would be more effective, and she dodged the question. I asked her if she knew that partial ownership by workers of a workplace already existed in capitalism, in the form of some companies offering stock options for employees as part of hiring, and she dodged the question. I asked her how her rules would be enforced, which is when she mentioned those township councils, and then I asked asked her if force would be used by these councils to prevent bosses and workers willingly exchanging in barter for work simply beyond partially owning the workplace, and she dodged the question. But here's the most telling part of my whole exchange with her. I said to her, let's pretend I'm running my own business, with just me working in it. If I wanted to bring on somebody to help me work, expanding my business into a two-person enterprise, 
I would not be allowed to simply pay them out for their work, right? I would have to offer this other person 50% ownership of my business? She agreed, that's how it would work. And then I asked her, well, what if I can't find anybody willing to work as hard as I am on my business? What if the business is my passion project, like say, my YouTube channel or my stream? Why should anybody else deserve an equal share of ownership in the project if to me it's a passion I will invest my all in, and to them it's simply a job? Her reply was striking, and it gave me a hard look into the mind of a true socialist. According to her, I didn't actually feel passionately or work hard on my business the way I describe myself as doing. According to her, all people inherently invest the same amounts of work into all things, as long as they're not being oppressed by capital. The idea that some people work harder than others, that some people have passion for their projects, that some people may be considered to be exceptional, was simply a capitalist myth. Everybody's the same. I was lying about my passion, and anyone I picked up off the street would do as a co-owner of my enterprise because I don't work harder or care more, I'm just a liar. This is what socialism is, folks. It does not believe in the true passion that humans can feel for their life's work. It does not believe in a calling. It does not believe that people are capable of becoming more than they currently are. It attributes all differences in work ethic not to ability, talent, competence, education, experience, or passion, but simply due to the oppression present in the boss-worker dynamic. And when that dynamic is removed, socialists believe all human beings to be unchangingly equal in their capacity to work. It does not believe in growth through effort, or successful entrepreneurship, or motivations beyond simply subsisting. Socialism talks about rights, but not responsibility. It talks about alleviating suffering, but not about creating wonders. It talks about survival, but nothing beyond that. It talks about being alive, but not living a full life. But like I said before, this woman was an anarcho-socialist. Maybe all the problems come from the anarcho part of that equation. So, let's talk about state socialism. Well, we kind of already did. A lot of the arguments against fascist economics also apply to state socialism. A contemporary example is Venezuela. The Venezuelan government has seized approximately it all. And of course, the verified Twitterinos love to talk about how Venezuelan socialism isn't real socialism because it's state tyranny. Not understanding that socialism requires state tyranny to exist because the owners of the means of production aren't going to give up those means unjustly unless you impose massive force on them. There's a Twitter verified account called the Official Socialist Party, which by the way, shows you the real worthlessness of that blue check mark. But this account has some choice takes. Like this, for instance. There needs to be far more discussions and preparations taking place worldwide so that there can be a smooth transition to genuine socialism. Actual socialism has never existed anywhere. It won't exist until global capitalism has ended. Outdated economics get replaced by better ones. A moneyless society with no ruling class is next. You know, there's a lot of things that are just straight up wrong here, but let me touch on one that I haven't mentioned yet in this video. The claim that actual socialism will not exist while capitalism exists. Why not? Can't you go have your actual socialism somewhere while some other group of people somewhere else not in contact? with you has a capitalist system? Why does socialism need to be all-encompassing, blanketing over every country and person before it can be considered to be functional or real? Why does the mere existence of capitalism somewhere outside of the borders of socialism cause socialism to fail spectacularly? Is it because socialism necessitates a tyrannical government and a tyranny requires foreign scapegoats that its propaganda arm can use to distract the people from the tyranny they live under? Is it because if socialism actually existed everywhere, then there would be no more excuses for the government to use for its failure, and it always always fails? Oh man, here's Jeremy Corbyn praising Hugo Chavez. And Michael Moore, too. Is there any reason why you chaps haven't decided to go and live in Venezuela since it's such a paradise? Or why you haven't socialized your own massive amounts of personal wealth and property if the poor matter to you that much? I mean, it's not like Venezuelans are resorting to eating their pets or anything. Or that teenage girls are working as prostitutes to avoid going hungry. That would be an awful state of affairs. Though, considering the pedophilic state of Hollywood at the minute, there's a fair chance that underage pussy on tap might actually motivate Michael Moore to move to Venezuela after all. Okay, okay, I know I'm just spending some time here taking the piss out of these idiots. Let's actually discuss socialism seriously for a bit. It's written in Chandran Kukatha's article, The Cultural Contradictions of Socialism, that socialism is by its very nature doomed to fail. Socialist thinkers have usually presented social transformation as the solution to social ills, since the source of those ills has been held to be the social and economic order in which private interests and market relations are dominant. Once market relations are transformed, they have assumed, the way would be open for rule by the collective in the interest of the whole. In these circumstances, there is little need to say anything about how political institutions under socialism would check and control the exercise of power. The problem of the abuse of power no longer needs to be considered. 
It is liberal political theory that is focused on the problem of controlling the abuse of power, since it always assumes that there will always be a danger of such abuse. For in any society, there will always be particular interests trying to gain advantages for themselves. Tyranny is always possible, but socialism assumes, or hopes, that such problems will not arise, and so does not assume the need for political theory. Indeed, were it to borrow from a theory of politics, such as the liberal theory, that might help it address the problem of tyranny. Yet in avoiding such borrowing, socialism has also avoided in addressing the problem of how there can be a socialist order that is not simply a dictatorship by a socialist political elite. This is true of the socialism described by almost every socialist thinker, even though all of them envision the good socialist order not as a dictatorship, but as a society marked by collective self-rule for the good of the whole. In other words, socialism simply assumes that when capitalism is swept aside, the economic system and the people within it will naturally settle into worker ownership of the means of production all on its own. I know I'm saying like a broken record here at this point, but it's pretty clear that the socialists are ignorant regarding the nature of humanity. Finally, we come to the judgment of socialism. As an economic system, does socialism provide for a widely established in-group while still respecting the rights of a minority out-group in the realm of finance and production? Well, first of all, socialism lacks an out-group entirely. You could make the argument that socialism's out-group are the bosses or owners or management of a workplace, but unlike communism which simply wants to kill those people, socialism wants to demote them to the position of co-owner. So unlike anarchism, feudalism, or fascism, socialism wants to absorb as many people as it can into its in-group from its out-group until the out-group no longer exists. But does it provide for its in-group? The only reasonable conclusion one can come to is no. As an economic system, socialism does not provide for its in-group for several reasons. One, it's too bogged down with its own bureaucracy to make expedited decisions. Two, it provides no safeguards against its massive bureaucracy from becoming extremely corrupt. Three, it believes that the capability of becoming corrupt is some capitalist infestation and not something intrinsic to everybody. And finally, four, just as it does not recognize that innate evil in human beings, it also does not recognize the innate good in human beings, to strive for excellence. Socialism fails not only as an economic system, but as any form of social system. On communism. The critique of communist economics will likely use many of the same criticisms I use to critique socialist economics, because the two are closely related ideologies. However, there are a few key differences that are worth discussion. First, socialism advocates for worker co-ownership of the means of production. Communism, on the other hand, advocates for communal ownership of the means of production. Sounds similar, but is different. In a socialized factory, 50 workers might each own 1 50th of the factory. In a communized factory, each worker owns the entire factory, and everybody's rights overlap, creating community ownership. Of course, in practice, both options often meant state ownership of the factory due to the state being the only legitimate representative of the people, but fine, whatever, at least the theory is different. Second, like I mentioned just a bit ago, socialism advocates for leveling the playing field by forcing the bosses to have the same social standing as the workers, with everybody being a co-owner of the means of production. Communism, however, is entirely willing to just kill the bosses outright. Of course, this is not directly stated in the Communist Manifesto, but with a bit of reasoning, I think I can show you how this is indeed the case. The communist theory of hierarchy revolves around the idea that all hierarchies within a capitalist system are based in power, and only in power. The great class struggle that Karl Marx describes is a power struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, the haves and the have-nots. And there is some legitimate truth to this. The rampant, unregulated capitalism of Marx's time lacked a minimum wage or a maximum amount of hours worked per day or week, it lacked workers' rights and protections, and it had no problem with child labor. It would not be uncommon for the factories of that era to employ 10-year-old boys to work 16-hour days for a pittance, which is why so much of the Communist Manifesto revolves around either factories or farms. With industrialization and serfdom both serving to smother the working class, though using different methods. This is also why Russia ultimately became the core nexus of communist activity, as Russian feudalism had continued for several hundred years after Europe abandoned it. So, okay, it's reasonable to accept that hierarchies are based in power. There's a lot of evidence for this to be the case. But communism claims that all hierarchies are based in power without exception. That if somebody got to the top of any given hierarchy, it was a power play. Communism leaves no room for, say, a hierarchy of merit where the people who exhibit the greatest consistent skill rise to the top of the hierarchy based on that skill. And well, you might consider me to be naive for even believing that hierarchies of merit can exist in the first place, but no, no, I'm really not naive. Of course, power plays can corrupt hierarchies of merit, but power can only corrupt a hierarchy of merit so much before the hierarchy ceases to function entirely, and really, 
can we reasonably say that the hierarchies of merit that exist within Western capitalist democracies have been compromised to that degree? I don't think we can. I mean, look around you. You're likely watching this video on a computer right now, which gets its power through the power grid, and the data is being sent from your internet provider through the telecommunications grid. If the hierarchies of merit that govern electricity and the internet in your area were so hopelessly corrupted by incompetent people making power plays, would you still have power and internet at all? The fact that you're even able to hear my voice right now is testament to the hierarchies of your society functioning, at least somewhat, on merit. Complicated systems like power grids are falling apart all the time, and society is full of workers who go out and patch it back together constantly, and we are so good at doing this that we have things like water, power, heat, transportation, food, internet, and so on almost all the time. And hey, guys, if you ever actually meet a communist, ask him if he had to get, say, a dangerous operation performed, if he would shop around for the most competent surgeon he could find within his budget, and when he He naturally says yes, tell him that the competent surgeon is only in his position due to a hierarchy of power, and he would be better off going to the marginalized doctor instead of the privileged one. So, communism claims to want to upend those pesky hierarchies of power for the betterment of the poor, downtrodden working class. But in Soviet Russia, during the collectivization of all the farms, the most successful farmers were completely wiped out, either through force or starvation, and this action led to the starvation of millions of Ukrainians in the 1930s. Just so you can have a taste of what this was like, I'm going to read an excerpt from David Petra... Petch... Patrikarikos's... Fucking... I'll read an excerpt from David's article, Why Stalin Starved Ukraine. People crawled into wheat fields to Was this a case of the communists truly loving the poor and having good intentions, but their theory being so fundamentally flawed that it killed a lot of people? No, I don't think so. And this is where we finally come all the way back to communism's hidden desire to kill all their bosses, when socialism simply wants to strip them of their status. In 1937, George Orwell wrote the book the Road to Wigan Pier. It's one of his lesser known works, up against titans like Animal Farm in 1984, but it's still a very important book. In it, Orwell describes his own real life travels through the slums, ghettos, and mining towns of the UK, and paints a picture of desperate, grinding poverty. And really, you'd have to be a sociopath to not feel something for the people he encountered on his travels. It made sense that, at least for a short time after those trips, Orwell himself began to advocate for Marx's theories. However, this advocacy was short lived. And the road to Wigan Pier ends with probably the most accurate view into the mind of a communist, though he uses the term socialist, from a thinker who briefly scared with the idea himself out of compassion for the poor, but later rejected it. Orwell wrote, It may be said that even if the theoretical book-trained socialist is not a working man himself, at least he is actuated by a love of the working class. He is endeavoring to shed his bourgeois status and fight on the side of the proletariat. That obviously must be his motive. But is it? Sometimes I look at a socialist the intellectual, tract-writing type of socialist. With his pullover, his fuzzy hair, and his Marxist quotation, and wonder what the devil his motive really is. It's often difficult to believe that it is a love of anybody, especially of the working class, from whom he is of all people the furthest removed. The underlying motive of many socialists, I believe, is simply a hypertrophied sense of order. The present state of affairs offends them not because it causes misery, still less because it makes freedom possible, but because it is untidy. Poverty, and what is more, the habits of mind created by poverty, are something to be abolished from above, by violence if necessary, perhaps even preferably by violence. Hence the socialist worship of great men, an appetite for dictatorships, fascist or communist. The truth is that, to many people calling themselves socialists, revolution does not mean a movement of the masses which with they hope to associate themselves. It means a set of reforms which we, the clever ones, are going to impose upon them, the lower order. On the other hand, it would be a mistake to regard the book-trained socialist as a bloodless creature entirely incapable of emotion. Though seldom giving much evidence of affection for the exploited, he is perfectly capable of displaying a hatred, a sort of queer, theoretical hatred, against the exploiters. Hence the grand old socialist sport of denouncing the bourgeoisie. It is strange how easily almost any socialist writer can lash himself into frenzies of rage against the class to which, by birth or adoption, he himself invariably belongs. Now, to anybody who spends any amount of time on the internet, and especially on Twitter, and especially on the Twitter feeds of anybody with a verified blue check mark, the person Orwell describes has to sound extremely familiar, from fashion and fanaticism to interests and ideas. 
He describes a man-child, somebody who lives in the lap of luxury and has never felt true suffering, somebody who dresses themselves up in a specific way to show their status, but spends so much time bad-mouthing that status. He describes their fake rage against the oppressors, while not a peep comes from their mouths about the oppressed. These qualities all have their modern versions, from hipster game journalists, to rainbow-haired she-twinks, to verified Twitterinos. People who spend more time fake raging at whomever they perceive to be the latest oppressor of the day for the benefit of their own social status than they do on actual activism for the sake of the poor. And it becomes very clear exactly what type of people communists, and socialists too, are deep in their core. They do not love the poor. They simply hate the rich. So. Let's say a person like this comes along and states to you some rubbish like hierarchies of power function by privileging the powerful and marginalizing the powerless. By the communist's own logic, the claim can be made that because communism privileges hierarchies of power over hierarchies of merit, that under communism, merit is now the marginalized quality. I think this is why communists hate the rich. Because even in the most opportunistic, unregulated of capitalist societies, there will always be at least some people who manage to get rich based off their own merits. And that group will never ever contain the personality types that lead one to accept the philosophy of communism. From this point of view, the communist looks like a jealous, irrational child, determined to tear down everything solely because he wasn't the one that built it. But of course, the communist would never actually admit that to you. They probably wouldn't even admit it to themselves. If you were to ask the communist why he thought in these terms, his answer would be predictable. I care about the poor, and therefore I am a good person. And always in that order. Not I am a good person, and therefore I care about the poor, but I care about the poor, and therefore I am a good person. Well then, if you were smart, or even better if you felt like trolling him, you would ask the communist, well, when you say you're a good person, that's a position you're privileging. What about the ways in which you're an evil person? Aren't those ways being marginalized? And that sounds kind of funny, but there is truth to it. We all have good and evil inside of us. None of us are perfectly moral. And it's actually important that we recognize this fact, because if we're cognizant of our capacity to hurt other people, then we can control it. We can make decisions with forethought. But if a person were to truly believe that they were perfectly moral in everything, then what reason would they have to be careful in their dealings with other people? They wouldn't have one. They would simply charge ahead, thinking that because they are perfectly moral, their innate innocuous quality makes charging ahead perfectly safe. And they leave a wake of destruction behind them because they would be fool enough to not admit their own failings. In fact, let's say a perfectly moral person exists. And, somehow, this person was a communist. Best possible scenario. And let's say we, as a society, give that person the political power needed to make communism unfold in the real world. And as communism unfolds, and begins to fail because that is what it will always do, and people begin to die as a result of this, what would a perfectly moral communist do? They would stop communism. At least for a little while. At least to ask the question, what's going wrong? Why are people dying? How do we fix this scenario? They would not charge forward and kill tens of millions of people like every communist leader in the history of humanity has done. This is why you can never trust the moron that says true communism has never been tried or actual socialism has never existed. The implication is that everyone who's tried it were all morally deficient, but that they, the speaker, somehow have the inhuman morality to make communism work. But they don't. They're human, with failings, and would be corrupted by the absolute power necessary to make communism work. Just like you or I would. But they think they wouldn't be corrupted. And they would hold that belief right up to the revolution that finally deposes them and puts them to the sword. Such is the nature of the person that believes in communism. This conversation has taken us far beyond the bounds of communism as an economic system, and for that I apologize. But the failings of communism are so supreme that they cannot be discussed in an economic vacuum. Suffice it to say, Communism fails as an economic system for the same reasons that socialism did. It fails to provide for its massive in-group, it fails to account for political excess, and it operates on the hatred of the rich rather than the love of the poor. On capitalism. Finally, we're here to talk about capitalism. I have no clue how long this video is at this point, it's probably pretty long, but hopefully I have done an interesting enough of a job at laying a groundwork for why capitalism just works. Now there's obviously parts of capitalism that don't just work. 
I mentioned them earlier regarding child labor, a lack of workers' rights, and the horrible conditions of the industrial era factories. Those horrors make me fully understand why Marx, and other thinkers of his time, sought desperately for an alternative to capitalism. But those conditions don't exist in functioning Western capitalist democracies, at least not often, and I don't think that any reasonable person nowadays would object to government intervention if something like that started to come back. In essence, a communist idea of what capitalism is is about 150 years out of date. The factories that Marx railed against, they don't really exist anymore. We have child labor laws now, and minimum wage laws, and maximum work laws. All reasonable restrictions that prevent an immoral employer from working their employees to death. Remember when I said that we can judge an economic system to be successful based on its providing for its in-group while not harming its out-group? Well, industrial era capitalism did fail that test, but modern, moderate regulated capitalism does not. But why does capitalism work? Well, that's a bit more complicated. Unlike the five other economic systems, capitalism accounts for personal liberty. It allows all people, including the working class, to have the choice to do whatever they like with their lives as long as they're able to do it themselves. Of course, there are still poor people and starving people and homeless people in the system. Capitalism isn't perfect. But within properly regulated capitalism, poor people at least have an opportunity to get ahead in the game. For example, things like student loans exist in capitalism, where a poor person can get a loan to go to school in a useful field, get a well-paying job, and then repay their loans and join the middle class. This is possible even in the USA, where the capitalist system lacks some of the more reasonable regulations. It simply requires that a poor person go to school for something useful and not feminist dance therapy. Capitalism is inherently a hierarchy of merit, where people will rise and fall within a marketplace based on three factors. One how much effort they put into it, two, how much of that effort becomes victories, and three, how much they're able to learn from the effort if that effort becomes defeats. It is competitive, yes, and competition requires losers. And some people may lose many, many times for reasons that are truly not their fault. Capitalism doesn't account for long streaks of bad luck or well-meaning people who just can't get a break, but that is what reasonable regulation is for. And just so we're clear, the reason hierarchies of merit exist in the first place is due to a mathematical idea known as the Pareto Principle. The principle states that, over a long period of time, roughly 80% of the effects of a given situation come from roughly 20% of the causes. Velofrido Pareto, the father of the principle, had a hobby of growing green peas, and noticed that as he planted and replanted his crops over the years, approximately 80% of his harvest came from only 20% of last year's peas, and the rest of the peas only produced just enough to survive one more season or nothing at all. The Pareto Principle has been accurately applied to many situations across many species, from plants and animals to human behavior. It's what the libertarians would refer to as the exceptional individual, where a small class of hypercapable people do the vast majority of society's work and therefore deserve to reap the majority of the rewards. I don't entirely agree with the libertarian interpretation of the Pareto Principle. But at the very least, I know that the libertarians understand the principle better than the communists, mainly because the communists would never be able to grow peas in the first place. A great way to explain why Western capitalist democracies function so well is to look at both the needs of the individual and the needs of the state. In, say, a communist system, the needs of the state directly oppose the needs of the individual. They push against each other, where the individual need to benefit from his work and the state need to collectivize and redistribute all work naturally oppose each other. Using the same type of comparison, fascist economics allowed for success or failure based on merit, but only made it a matter of social collective interest when failure occurred. In other words, fascism did not reward success, but it did punish failure, for the reason of sabotaging the state's economy and wasting the people's resources. Western liberal capitalist democracies generally don't do this. In fact, when they function correctly, they do the opposite. We consider it a matter of social collective interest only when an economic endeavor succeeds. In other words, we reward success, but we do not punish failure because we understand that failure in economics is punishment enough all on its own. Just like with communism, fascism pits the economic forces of the state and the people directly against each other. But within capitalism, the needs of the individual and the needs of the state are aligned. It's in the best interest of the individual to benefit from his work for obvious reasons, but it's also in the best interest of the state that the individual benefit from his work due to the wider benefits of trade with other individuals. Still don't get it? Here's a scenario that might help. Let's say you have a carpenter and he makes chairs. The chairs he makes have a market value of $10 per chair. He can sell them for 10 bucks. And let's say you have a baker 
and he bakes bread. The loaves of bread he bakes have a market value of $10 per loaf of bread. I know, we're just using hypothetical numbers here. At first glance, it might seem like one loaf of bread is equal in value to one share, and to the marketplace at large, that's true. But it's not true to the carpenter or the baker. The carpenter has so many chairs, and he makes them so easily, they're not worth $10 to him personally. He's probably not going to go out and spend 10 of his own dollars on a chair when he can make his own. And the same goes for the baker. His bread isn't worth $10 to him either. So if the baker and the carpenter were to come together and decide to trade one loaf of bread for one chair, even though both objects are worth the same amount of money, each person values the other object more because it's something they don't have and can't easily make themselves. It was a completely fair trade, $10 for $10, but the baker and the carpenter each got something of higher value to themselves in the trading. Everyone walks away happier, but more importantly, everyone walks away with more value than they had before. And by the way, that's the point of money, socialists. Money has no power in itself. It's simply a way of easily facilitating a barter system, where all individuals in a given market value everyone else's goods more than their own, and are all willing to trade in such a manner that everyone ends up with more personal value than what they started with. Of course, there will be people that exploit the system, people who steal or sell fake goods that aren't worth their price, and so on. But the combination of an intelligent, well-educated population, market forces that allow quality to naturally dominate over time, and in the most extreme cases, government regulation, can adequately tackle the problem of economic exploitation. This example also illustrates the value of specialization, a concept that the anarchists can't seem to wrap their head around. A carpenter can, over time, learn to build better quality chairs more quickly and cheaply if he keeps practicing his craft. A baker can learn to bake better quality bread for the same reason. But if everyone had to learn every single skill, then nobody would produce anything of exceptional quality. Tell me, anarchists. How many part-time doctors does it take to cure cancer? And I know that arguing from results is kind of a no-no, but let me indulge myself a little bit here. If capitalism is so flawed and weak and awful, why hasn't it been crushed yet? Why do things held in community always fall apart in comparison to things held privately? If these systems actually worked and didn't run counter to human nature, why do people still not put their garbage in public garbage cans? Why do parks need public works departments to regularly clean and maintain them? Or on a larger scale, why didn't the Soviet Union outlast the United States? Why has prosperity worldwide only improved under capitalism in the long term? Why hasn't this stuff worked? Oh, and the answer is not because it's never been tried. It's clearly been tried. You just don't like the results. Believe it or not, sometimes the stated outcome on a theory does not line up with the actual outcome of the practice. In fact, if you are a communist, you should probably be happy that you live in a capitalist society, because if you really want to, you can get together your commune, you can go off into the woods, and live terrible, pathetic, dreary, collectivized lives. Why don't more communists do this? I presume it's because they want to drag the rest of us down with them. And believe it or not, there's even a moral case for capitalism, for all you moralists and spiritualists out there. Aside from inheriting money, which is its own separate conversation, or you finding a lucky $20 bill on the sidewalk or something, people generally only manage to get their hands on money by somehow contributing to society. You make something you sell, or you go to a job where you perform valuable labor, or you donate to my Patreon, haha. <laughs> At some point, you have interacted in society in a meaningful way. You have provided enough value to somebody else that somebody else was willing to pay you money for that value. So you take your money down to the grocery store and you ask the clerk there for some food. And the clerk asks you, well, did you contribute to society in a meaningful way today? And you say, yes, I did. And the clerk says, well, how do I know? How do I know you're not just lying? And you say, well, I provided value to another person and he gave me this money in return. And the clerk says, okay, that's great. And then he takes your money and then you get your groceries. That's the underlying conversation that happens when you go shopping for groceries. And the money that you give the clerk eventually makes its way back to him in the form of wages for his labor and the cycle continues. In this instance, Possession of money can be seen as proof of contribution to society, which does have moral implications. I know this isn't perfect because there are certainly jobs that should be getting paid more for moral reasons that currently aren't, but we're getting there. No, really, we're getting there. Capitalism is the reason we're living in the age of technology. Capitalism is the reason that there have been massive quality of life increases worldwide in the past hundred years. Capitalism is the reason that when the United Nations stated their intent to cut world poverty in half by 2015, they managed to hit that mark in 2011. Capitalism is not just the mindless pursuit of wealth until the entire system destroys itself. At least, not if it's properly regulated with the interests of the individual at heart. Capitalism is a system where people can act freely in accordance with their own desires. And if the fruits of the work they perform in the service of their desires has some worth to their fellow man, capitalism allows them to survive and thrive off of those fruits. 
But of course, capitalism isn't perfect either. There's still a lot of people out there who fall through the cracks. But a well-regulated, but not state-controlled capitalist economy, interfered with by the government not for the benefit of the state or the collective, but for the benefit of the individual, and only interfered with so that they may freely contribute value to one another, will have the tools that we need not to help the poor, but to allow the poor to help themselves. And let me corrupt the Winston Churchill quote here a little bit, for my own ends. Capitalism is the worst form of economics except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time.